We have always long term in mind. Uh, we see through the troubles and the dust of the short term and see the line of long term. Respect the future, respect for the environment, respect for the next generation. Don't be bossy. Leadership is not a position. Leadership is dynamics, it's action, it's motivation, it's energy. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last one of our Learning from Leader series for this year. Uh, we have the privilege to welcome today the chairman of Nestle, Mr. Paul Bulke. And as, I, as always, I'm joined by Peter Van Am, that is on the Geneva campus today. Good afternoon, Peter. The floor is all yours. Thank you, and that's almost literally true, isn't it? Because I'm uh, sitting here on your floor uh, today, on the second floor of the EU Business School in Geneva. So thank you for lending me this floor and, uh, and being with, uh, with you again. It's a pleasure, everyone, to see you again. Uh, uh, here in Geneva, it's getting dark uh, as we speak. As a matter of fact, it is, uh, it is getting dark. It's winter. Uh, and our guest today, uh, he usually would have been in a similar situation where he saw the sunset and the cold days of the Swiss uh, winter. But in fact, uh, he will tell us in just a minute, I think, that uh, he's somewhere else. I'm very curious to find out where. This guest that I'm talking about, of course, is none less than Paul Bulke. And Paul Bulke is most famously known, of course, as the chairman of Nestle, the largest consumer goods company in the entire world. He was also previously the CEO of that company for many years. And today he is here with us. It is a wonderful priv privilege to have you, Mr. Bulke, Paul. And I want to ask you now first, because now I think I made everybody wonder, how are you? But most importantly, where are you? Well, thank you, uh, Peter. And uh, I want to say hello to everybody. And uh, this is the last call, so um, it's a privilege uh, that I can do that. I'm actually in Chile. I just arrived wow. yesterday. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's far away uh, in summertime. So <clears throat> it's four hours difference, and I have uh, sunny weather here. And, uh, and that's what we do normally for Christmas with the family. You know, I lived here, and, and my daughter went back, and she lives here, has her family. And that's why we then try always in summertime to have Christmas on a, yeah, with a swimming pool, which is not a bad idea. You know, you were answering my question very kindly, uh, but by answering, you immediately raised so many other questions, uh, Paul. You mentioned just off the cuff that, you know, it's usual for you to be in Chile because you've lived there and that your daughter lives there. I mean, I'm very curious now what, you know, before we, we talk, of, of course, about less happy things, uh, could you tell us why, why, why is it that you actually live there in Chile? Well, uh, I, I started actually Nestle uh, no, more than 40 years ago. I called Nestle. We lived, uh, my wife and I, in, in Belgium, and I had a job there. But we always wanted to go abroad. And, um, and you have to do it when you're young. So I had a friend who worked for Nestle who was, was speaking Latin America was quite appealing to us, and I called Nestle. I think we uh, lost you there for one second. Uh, uh, we were all, all also happy to see you in the sun, uh, the yeah. beautiful Chile, uh, and now you're back with us. So you were telling us about uh, uh, that you uh, were young and, and you wanted to go abroad. Yeah, and so I called, and, 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 and Latin America was appealing to us, and I asked, uh, say, I told Nestle, not a lot of experience, but a lot of answers he has. We want to uh, try an international career, my wife and I. And uh, so and then I started in Peru. That was in the early 80s, uh, 1980, exactly. And uh, so uh, and we've been ever since uh, 16 years in Latin America. Uh, wow. Peru, uh, Ecuador, and Chile, and before we left in for Portugal. And um, that's why we have a certain affinity. My daughter, she studied in Belgium, worked there, but then she goes to books and comes back here. We, um, and she lives here with her family, three kids. So that's, that's how it goes, these expatriate lives. And, but it's fascinating. It's a fantastic country, has its struggles, but, but still fantastic country. It's always a good, uh, good time we have here. So it's our second yeah. home somewhere. 
No, it's absolutely true, and 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 I think you've you've shared once with us, and and, and you're doing it now, of course, about uh, you know how your family, as a consequence of your international career, is a little bit scattered all around the world. Uh, but you really uh, seem to be taking that in the best possible way, uh, namely by by traveling to see them when you when you can, and and you seem to be a very dedicated and happy global citizen. Well, look, it's enriching. Uh, I mean, uh, ex expatriates' lives uh, as we have it with a fine company uh, as Nestle. It's very enriching because you see different uh, countries through different idiosyncrasies, different languages. You, 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 you have friends all over the world, and and uh, not not one boring year. Uh, so I can only say it's it's very enriching, and then that's what we're enjoying. Yes, my family yeah. is spread over, but logical. I mean, uh, uh, my son uh, lives in Luxembourg. The other one is now in Chicago, doing a little bit wow. the same. It's yeah, you, 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 you build it somewhere in, in the fabric of your family. And, uh, and now with all the communication means, like what we do now, um, it's much easier than before. So, no, it's, it's a very interesting, enriching life we have. Yeah, no, it's true. And, of course, uh, it was almost perfect, uh, you could say, until uh, very recently, until last year, when indeed, you know, people like yourself and like ourselves, like I think many of the students, could travel all over the world and, and discover all these places. Now, of course, in the last year, we've been hit by coronavirus, by the pandemic. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, both Switzerland, where you usually live, and Chile uh, were very hard, hard hit, weren't they? How would you compare the situation? Could you tell us a little bit more about the situation in Chile on that front? And how would you compare that situation with Switzerland and the rest of the world? Well, uh, also, this continent was hard hit, like every place in the world. I mean. Uh, you, you see even Switzerland, you would think, uh, but the whole Western Europe and, and North America. And so it was hard. What you do have, though, is you have a certain lifestyle, but also less safety nets somewhere. Uh, so uh, the same problem is, is felt much harder. And it was combined also with some, in Chile, specifically with some social unrest. So combined. But I would not say this was so much more harder hit uh, but it has less reserves. Also economically, you know, you're going to see it. one of the biggest problems after. We have a health crisis now, worldwide, give and take. Uh, but the economical crisis that's going to come out also for Western Europe, definitely. But in these countries, as they don't have safety nets, as they're also the money flow from the Western world or the developed world towards these countries is going to dry up to a certain extent. I think that's going to be uh, harder and it's going to be uh, having a more lasting effect in these countries. Yeah, it's something we don't you say talk that. too much because we have our problems in the Western world. So we look at our belly, uh, but but uh, the developing world is is gonna is gonna have a, a long lasting, a longer lasting effect economically speaking. I would say. Yeah, you say that in a very matter of factual way, of course, because you can look at it in a rational. Uh, perspective, but that is really one of the key takeaways for you, is it then, that now that the public health crisis may recede thanks to the vaccines arriving, especially in uh, Western uh, countries, uh, that in fact uh, we're going to see a bigger divergence, you could say, in terms of the fallout, the economic fallout, social fallout of the virus, which will remain present for a longer time uh, and therefore have longer term ramifications on emerging markets. But you see, you have the same effect in the developed markets. Uh, you see, in the, in, in, in the same country, people are differently hit. And not depending on the economic activity per se, if you have a restaurant, for example, you're, you're directly hit if they close all restaurants. But also the, the, the less affluent part of these uh, uh, countries, our countries, developed countries, is, is harder hit. So somewhere, these crises, when you have a crisis like this, uh, it hits differently uh, the, the different layers of society. The same goes macroeconomically and geographically. Uh, the developing world is going to be hit harder uh, by the economical impact of, of what's happening now. I mean, yeah, and, and we've seen that, of course, already play out to a certain degree. Um, but in fact, after the first wave, uh, we were all kind of hopeful that we would have the virus under control uh, especially in Europe and perhaps uh, to a certain extent in, in, in the U.S., certainly in China. But what we've seen instead 
is that uh, the Western world, at least, has been hit very badly by this second wave. And I think that you, too, uh, were a little bit perhaps caught off guard by that. You were very optimistic after the first uh, wave and, and hopeful and looking forward. Um, wh what is your perspective now? And, and, and if you do remain optimistic, how do you stay optimistic? Well, we, we have to be optimistic. And, I mean, um, the, this, first of all, this pandemic, humanity has gotten so many of these and, and uh, we had world wars. And so we went through big, big crises. We should, but somewhere we were, I would not say spoiled, but we were spoiled with a very, I would say, um, steady, positive building up mode over so many years. So we're not used to that anymore. It impacts us. I was optimistic after the first wave. I said, look, we, uh, we may have flares coming back with the winter and people go inside more and all. And, but uh, the flares are, all these different flares are joining. So you have a big wave. Uh, somewhere we were too relaxed again. Uh, and, and, and this virus is all over. It's, 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 it's there, it's present. We cannot see it. And uh, uh, we also said that, that this is going to be really under control when we have vaccines. And, uh, and they are coming upstream apparently and with different uh, interpretations and different urgencies and, and risk taking. But it's only when the vaccine is going to be omnipresent and accepted that that, that is going to fade out. But the virus is, virus is not going to have enough uh, ground anymore. But, but, but yes, we have a second wave and, and they speak already of a third wave. Let, let's, let's see. I do believe though that so much in it is in our hands individually, to, 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 to do the right things. And, and that uh, you're not going to repeat what, what has happened, but uh, closed rooms, the virus stays in the closed rooms. And winter times, you stay inside. So that, that's what you have. People say, yeah, after seven, eight months, I, I need a party. Well, I'm, yeah, yeah, you need a party. You don't say, so uh, over the generations, me also, we, we have to get used, these are difficult times and you have to take responsibility. And, and it's not only your uh, uh, health, uh, you are a factor of other, ones, uh, other people's health. So assume that, uh, that responsibility somewhere. And uh, yeah. uh, the vaccine is another thing. You can't have theoretically the vaccine, but you have to have the logistics, you have to have the numbers, billions uh, of vaccines uh, administrated. That is a major task of production and logistics. So we know all that. So I think uh, this is a call for self-responsibility, understanding the context and assume your responsibility for yourself and towards the others. Yeah, but of course you have that message, but I think uh, you also of course have seen a lot of crises in the past, haven't you? Um, and and is, that, is that why why you remain optimistic? Why you say we have it in our own hands and we will get out of this, but let's see and take it step by step. I mean, you, you, you've had big crises in the past, haven't you, even in, in Latin America. Could you tell us a little bit about that and, and, and how that has shaped your outlook on things like these, on disasters like these? We had, not we, uh, humanity had, and I personally lived through quite a few difficult situations. Let me uh, just call, when I started, uh, we went to Peru, Peru in 1980. That's where the shining path started, uh, that stabilized that make the whole country very unstable, uh, dangerous to a certain extent. And uh, for a family with children, uh, and we adapted to that. We had our measures to, to, to make sure that we stay safe. And, and, and a believer of, of, of the capacity and the creativity and, and the will of people and, uh, and societies at large to, to overcome these. We have done it so many times. And somewhere when you're in the crisis, you say, Jesus, I mean, you have no experience. Is that going to work? But then you go through these things um, over and over again. And, and, and then you get somewhere inside a, an inner tranquility, somewhere, not an easiness, but, but hey, uh, I don't have all the answers. I don't see uh, to get out of this very soon, but I'm confident. Uh, we as a person, we as a family, we as a company, we as a society, we're going to find ways to, to overcome this. And, and that's the strength of, of what I would say is humanity. You see also over the last so many years, 
um, in spite of all the, the, the first on, on short term intensity of problems we have, think about the environment, think about the instability geopolitically, think about um, wars. You, you think we're living in the worst of times, yet you see the line that goes up better and better. We have taken out 800 million, 900 million people out of uh, extreme poverty. Somewhere 200, 250 are sliding back into it. But, but that means still 600. And you have to see this line. That's where I source my optimism. It is yeah. the past has proven, uh, has shown, and we have proven that we can do it. And I believe we will. Yeah, it's it's very uh, encouraging, I think, for many of us to, to hear that. And you already talked a little bit about your personal experience where you were in Peru at a very difficult time of that country. Um, but like you have been in that country and Nestle stayed there together with you, um, you've been also with the company uh, in many other countries that had very, very difficult times. I mean, some of the countries that we talked about uh, previously, Syria, Venezuela, Myanmar, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, I mean, really name a disaster uh, a country and, and Nestle is there, stays there and, and over the long haul also seems to be finding it worth to stay there. Could you tell us a little bit about that, uh, that, that, say, that philosophy of Nestle and also uh, what that uh, sort of brings to the table for you as we go through this pandemic today? Uh, one, one sentence. You should tell us that strategic you just broke and, up for a second. A first, we, we just lost you on that one sentence. Uh, the, the, in one, the answer is one sentence. We are a strong believer in our, uh, I would say, strategic direction, our purpose. And secondly, we, look, we have always long term in mind. Uh, we see through the troubles and the dust of the short term and see the line of long term. When you have that, that's why we stay in countries. Uh, uh, it's a little bit linked up with, with call it the Swiss character also, stubbornness with conviction. And uh, we're still in Venezuela. We have still five factories there. Now that, I, I would have said when, when uh, Chavez came on uh, as a president and all, we said, well, that cannot last too long. It was lasting longer than we thought, but we were still five factories, 2,500 people on the payroll, thousands of farmers working with us. And that is linked somewhere with loyalty. We have 2,500, 600 people, and they showed loyalty. We have to show loyalty to them too. And uh, the farmers, and our activity is linked with farming. You don't shut down a cow for a few days or a week, uh, waiting for better times. So it's intrinsic to our DNA to, to stay put, to do it. We have a few conditions though, and, and, and yep. the safety, the safety of our people and the people working with us is, is the first one. The second one, we have to own what we have to own, which is not only our intellectual property, but also we have to own our assets. And the, and the third one is we have to be able to live up to what we want to do, which is quality of products, quality of uh, working conditions. So these are the three elements. And when, whenever they are still there, we try to do it and we are already decentralized. So we have people uh, on, on, in the trenches there who understand, who know how to re-engineer uh, in the framing of all principles. And actually in Venezuela, it's a lady, we're still in Syria. Uh, we stay put in, the, in Zimbabwe, where, where the Western world was claiming, hey, you should leave. Uh, you actually, by your activity, you're stabilizing the country and we want to instabilize it so the dictator goes. That's not our job. There were 280 people in our factory, 280 families that could still think about the better tomorrow, could still have a decent uh, life, still have their kids going to school. We have 1,400 farmers delivering every day their milk to our factory. So yeah. that's what the company should do. I mean, that's, that's how we call that creating shared value. A company should, through its purpose and its value, whatever it does, it should create value for shareholders being successful in other words as a company, but also create be a force for good in the communities and society it works in. And that yeah. is true for Nestle, through our activities, through our products, we through uh, combining and connecting with uh, uh, local communities and uh, farmers and uh, our own employees. Yeah. So it's quite simple to formulate it. Uh, it's harder to live up to it, but that's what you have to do.
No, and you seem to have a North Star in terms of uh, where you want to go and also those conditions, uh, safety, IP ownership, and the freedom to produce uh, quality uh, food. Now, of course, that's, let's say, the, the overall ideas that you have about operating in any country in the world. Now, on top of that, of course, you were faced with a very immediate crisis, the pandemic. As a, as a company, how did you react to that? And what were perhaps some of the principles that you lived with uh, as you went through the pandemic with the company? Actually, I'm proud of how people reacted, the rest of the people, and all who was linked with us. First of all, we, we had very early on to auto-confine ourselves. That was the third week of February already. We wow. said no, no travel. Uh, we said also we're going to lower the presence, physical presence, uh, in our wherever we are. Factories are harder. But factories do have already a quite a high level of, of hygienic conditions and discipline. We leveled that up of course. even more, walkways, so that people could uh, uh, don't, don't cross each other. Um, so we very, very early on set a very clear uh, sign. Actually, we call it SAS. SAS. S. Tell us, what does it stand for? First. Uh, safety of our people first. First S. Second A. Activity. Do what you have to do. This is important that people can have food. And that's our, that's our job. So make sure you continue, you re-engineer your supply chains, but you keep on going. You stay as close as possible to normal times in what you do, activity. So safety, activity, and then solidarity. Solidarity means, hey, you, you, you're part of communities. We're very decentralized, so we're part of these communities. So extend that uh, uh, good behavior or trying to be positive to, 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 uh, to your um, close community. That means, for example, extending credits, payments for people, whether it's a small, the farmers, uh, accelerate the payments to them. Um, be solidar we have worked with the Red Cross quite intensively. We normally uh, uh, work with the Red Cross. They're all over the place. They are always neighbors to us. So we work with them too. Um, and that's, so SAS, safety of our people and everybody who's linked with us, our activity, keep your activity going, and then also uh, show solidarity. And it has worked well yeah. for us. And again, in the head office, we, we went down to 10%, 15% of presence, went up again to 50, we're back to one third now. Uh, so, and that is happening all over the world. Yeah, and you seem to be coming out of the crisis then rather well also because of course you know what you were, you were doing. Now many other uh, companies, many other uh, societies are facing a lot of problems. Uh, we got one question, for example, from Richard Moore. He's saying, well, one of the consequences of this uh, crisis is that uh, there's increased food insecurity in many places. Um, as a company who, of course, uh, produces food and is, is the biggest food producer in the world, do you feel particularly um, addressed when you know that reality? And, 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 and what does Nestle feel like it can do to, to solve that or help solve that problem? Well, first of all, we are, we are we're an important food company, but we're not the food uh, supplier of the world either. So, but we're part of, of the fabric. And uh, so that's why the second, the A there, uh, stay, status quo, make your factories working at level. So we basically could maintain a 90 plus percent of our, of our production intensity. Uh, we, we have short supply chains as we are very decentralized. Uh, we have short supply chains. Um, that is linked to our strategic conviction that freshness of this link with, with uh, raw materials that are close, you produce and sell uh, very, very close to where, where, where the consumer is. So, and that has proved to be a very resilient system uh, and, and set up. We were sometimes criticized, you should have major, bigger factories, scale up your factories. And we never did that. Food allows that too. So, second, we were happy and lucky that the food industry per se was less affected than other industries. I wouldn't like to be in the airline industry, for example. I mentioned the smaller uh, restaurants. Yeah, yeah restaurant owner. Uh, they have hard times. And, and so we are in that sense, our industry uh, is on the better side there, less affected. But a lot of yeah. rewire engineering, but that's what we do. And, and being decentralized allows you to have the, the right brains and hands in situ where you are operating, where you sell. To, to, to do that. So um, that's, as yeah. I must say, 
I, I, I take my hat off, off also for for the Nestle people because they have lived up to that. In, in exactly yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and often in a crisis, indeed, the most important thing that you can do, uh, it's almost like when you sit in a plane and they say, uh, put on your own mask first before attending to uh, those people next to you. And maybe that's indeed the most important thing that a food company can do is make sure it takes care of its people and produces the food it usually does. And then if there's any additional capacity, do, do more. Now, um, I want to ask you another question, because, of course, as we hopefully get out of this pandemic slowly, uh, in 2021, of course, we'll be faced with so many other challenges, right? Uh, those that were already there, the climate crisis, uh, you know, widening inequality, many other uh, challenges facing us uh, tomorrow as well. What do you find to be the most important one? And, uh, and how can Nestle contribute to helping solve these gigantic uh, societal challenges? Well, yeah, uh, we have mentioned already quite a few of them. Um, challenges today and, and maybe afterwards more in certain geographies or others, etc. Um, but, but what we didn't do either is parking the other problems and say, hey, um, we, 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 we have this pandemic, let's focus on that and forget all the rest. Uh, so that, that's another job of company to do. And actually a board, that's a job also of a board to maintain also your executional, your executives. Um, they have to focus on, on, the, on the short term in pandemics. And, and big problems, but maintain that balance of long term, short term. So, and, and, and when you think long term, then these other problems come in, like environment. Hey, before the crisis, we were uh, gotten aware of this, uh, not as new, but, but more intensively as a society, plastics. That's one of these. And uh, we have been working on plastic for a long time, light weightening and uh, reducing and using more paper arguments and in, in our packaging. But that has intensified society got an intensity of awareness on this that uh, leads then also to say hey we, we we have a rise on that law we commit to something we have announced last week a, a major effort there to 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 be executing behind and an, an ambition that everybody has there of uh, net zero uh, uh, green go, uh, gas in in 2050 that's a long way out we say we're going to go for that too so we could commit to that and then once year time, we come back with a concrete plan. Oh, we want to do this because claiming something that is out so far is easy. And that's what we did last week, saying, look, we have, and that's not only in our walls. This is in including upstream and downstream. Upstream, because 70%, two thirds at least, of our uh, carbon let, footprint. Let, is, let, is, let's, is, let's break that down because I, I think maybe not everybody understands what that means, right? So you said, first of all, we commit to be carbon neutral. That means that we will, of course, still emit carbon. But on the other hand of the equation, we will do activities that will uh, offset that carbon emission. And then secondly, you said we want to do this across our entire supply chain. That means that not only in your own factories, what you do, uh, you're making carbon neutral, but you're also looking, and this is what you said, upstream. Upstream means the suppliers, the, the farmers, for example, uh, and downstream, you said, which is uh, towards the supermarkets and the consumers. I think that's what that means. So tell us a little bit more, because this is really both very important and not very easy to understand. Neither is it very easy to do. Could you tell us, how do you go about this ambition to be carbon neutral across the supply chain? First of all, if you want to be honest on this, you have to include this. If not, you're not. I mean, um, it's relatively easy to be carbon neutral uh, inside of the walls. I mean, you can offset, you can do. If you know that two thirds of your carbon footprint as a company is actually obscene, which is farming, which is ingredient, agricultural ingredients. And so saying now we do that and we don't care about the rest. No, we can have an impact that we do already work uh, so intensively with farmers. You know that we have direct contact with 700,000 farmers. We have over 1,000 agronomes in our payroll and, and 10,000 indirectly linked with that. So we, we, we can and we have to have an impact on that. And so we include them. And, and, and that's a major challenge, as you can. We have also a few years to do that. So we have a mapping, a roadmap for this. Uh, but we have also scale. 
And we not alone in this. Uh, other industries or other companies are doing the same. Certain things do uh, need collegial action on certain things. You have to agree on certain measurements and standards because then you can steer your efforts better. You have to invest. Yeah. You have to invest. So that's why we have committed to this uh, in the years to come, in the, in the close years to come, over 3.5 billion. Now that's that. That's that's a lot of money, but we know that's what has. To, that's what also over time the consumers are going to value. So it's not a company claiming this. We want to claim that also through our brands because the brands is actually the door with which you go to the consumer with his yeah. expectations. So it's a holistic plan. You, you can go into our webpage and see it's, it's, it's we have worked a, a full year on speci specific steps to see uh, how that all works. Uh, that is linked also with, with uh, technology, with more uh, vegetarian protein arguments in our supply yeah. chain, because we know that meat, we, we don't want to ban meat, but we can do so much more protein delivery through, through uh, vegetarian uh, arguments that has an impact of one to 10. So uh, that's why I don't have a simple answer to this. You have to really go and see how we have split it up in so many actions and steps yeah. and are we going to measure it uh, um, and we're going to report back on, on this which is basically i think uh, uh, something that is so much linked with this creating shared value being a positive force in a society and that's not greenwashing or this is not pr uh, this is 300,000 people in nestle committed to this to the living yeah and, uh, and and, and you're going to be doing this, as you said, a gigantic task to be doing this upstream with all the farmers all over the world that you work with, but also downstream. That means towards the consumer, the supermarkets. And we got a question about this from um, Gautam, who's with us. And he says, well, uh, you know, I understand that Nestle is doing many things. For example, on packaging, plastic packaging, a huge problem. You mentioned it already. Um, now we saw a report recently in, in the news, again, all the big consumer goods uh, companies are actually producing an awful lot of plastic, single-use plastic. And Gautam is asking, uh, on that front, which you have in your own hands, because you make the packaging and you decide on it, how come it is so slow, this transition? Uh, why can't we go quicker? Because it's true, I go to the supermarket, I buy a lot of your products, and it's true, they're 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 mostly still packaged in plastic why is it that it's so slow this transition and do you see let's say a positive outcome uh, and when but look uh, you're right why are we not going faster why not tomorrow because it's just not possible and so we can wish but wishing in a company is counterproductive if you don't is it technology? Is it, is it consumer acceptance? What, what, what makes it impossible to do it so, tomorrow? It's, well, we've, we, we've gone a long way already and so much more is to come. There is acceleration there. But think about it. Food safety, bringing quality food, safe food, also delicious food to consumers, has been so much served thanks to that technology of, of, of plastic protection. Um, so. And, and it is so entrenched in our fabric of society now. And, and, and food is actually exactly where the consumer touches every day. But plastic is all over. Think about car industry, think about uh, textiles, think about, so it has been a blessing. And we embrace this as a society as, hey, that's a major step forward. It is clear that overdoing it and not recycling it and not taking care of it that's bad and it is sizable. Giving a solution to something that is so sizable and so entrenched in how we live. It's, it's not by, it's not switching off the light on or off. Uh, but it's not because it's with the first step. These steps were done already many years ago. We have been lightweight in plastic. We have reduced plastic already quite sizable. So much more to be done. That's why we have also this packaging institute because also science allows you now, now you to give answers that we didn't have in the past. Science, how can you make paper having this same layer, I would say from oxygen 
defense so that you have no oxidation of your food. Well, that's what we're working on. Uh, how can you have that biodegradable uh, in such a way that you don't have to recycle? Um, how can you also make sure you have recyclable capacity? Because so much on plastic can be done if you recycle yeah. plastic. PET, the, the plastic bubbles, if you recycle it, it's so noble that you can really use it. There you go, uh, that you can use it again. So again, not one answer, many different angles to it that converges to much less uh, uh, plastic uh, in, in our system. Uh, and it is linked with consumers. That's why we say we have to integrate supply chains and to the consumer. Our, our uh, carbon footprint goes till we have it on the shelf. Uh, 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 that's where the carbon, but plastic is another story. We have to go further, one step behind that. And it yeah. is also with education, because consumers have to have to uh, be part of this. That's why I said we have to translate all these efforts. Further down to, to consumers, have, I think you... Uh, certain choices uh, that have to link, be linked with education, has to be linked with making it part of an active part, not claiming part, but also active, active part. Look, um, this is quite yeah. inviting at the end of the day because uh, it's not something empty. Uh, it's going to be concrete. And, you know, uh, on plastic specifically, the, the efforts do have a direct impact. Global warming is much more broader, less tangible per se, although that's where we want to measure it. But plastic has direct impact, and that's where we want to play straight away too. That's a, so in this whole carbon neutral, plastic is, is something that we have very specifically high on the agenda. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've been asking you about this, but I also uh, want to give the opportunity to some of the students and the attendees here with us to ask their question, because you'll see it's really a concern and a question that many uh, of our participants have. I want to perhaps turn first to Mia. Uh, Mia Oras Muhammadova. I hope I said that correctly, from Turkmenistan, who's yeah. studying at the Barcelona, sorry, at the Munich campus of uh, of eu business school and and mia i think you you share that concern don't you about sustainability why don't you go ahead and ask your question hello everyone yeah my question was about the about the which uh, sustainability programs nestle has and how the company tried to like reduce the plastic consumption in their like product packaging well basically we have a bit of that already so the biggest program we have already is what I mentioned, the zero, net zero uh, program, that you really, it's, it's too complex or too, too dense to just uh, uh, try to explain it to you in general. But what it does is our impact on, on greenhouse gas emission, on, on global warming, we want to have that neutral zero as, as in the full activity extended supply chain, as seen downstream. Uh, for 2050, we want to be in 50%, 55%, 2030, which is pretty much online, also with, with uh, the, uh, the sustainable development goals and the ambitions we have uh, as, a, as a broader society worldwide. So, and it's multi-layer, we have many activities. On specifically on, pla on plastic, uh, as I mentioned, it's first, use less plastic in our pack uh, packaging for our products, and that's where the institute comes in, how we look at uh, different uh, alternatives, different answers, uh, also how we want to work and, and be part of also recycling efforts because that's a very uh, direct uh, answer to this um, and also how we want to educate not only consumers because something is by behavior of consumers. So, yeah. uh, and, and, and we have also their timelines, uh, uh, we want to have in, in 2025, all our packaging should be recyclable or recycled. So th th that's a big commitment already, and plastic is part of this. Yeah, it's it, it's indeed a topic, and you know we learn about it. But uh, you know, even the, the bottle I'm drinking is, I think, one that's made by Nestlé. It's Henier in, in Switzerland, and indeed there it says, for example, yeah, this is plastic, but it's recyclable. It's it's uh, it, and it and it has been partially recycled. Is that indeed? Uh, you know, is that indeed true that one plastic is not another plastic? Well, look, one plastic is not a plastic that is thrown away in nature is a bad plastic. A plastic that is recovered through a system and reused is, is, is a useful, responsible plastic. So uh, you have to see what we're talking about. But, but it is true that 
if you have you have this bottle here i have yeah I'm sitting here with uh, also but, a nestle bottle i think yeah look uh, <laughs> but but this is first of all so much lighter already than it was 15 years ago uh, so that, that's technology possibilities of the we are using and some brands have on, only uh, already 100 percent recycled pet plastic um, so uh, but but light rating it even more and then it's possible so it is you still have the the, the practicality of of this bottle you're drinking from it uh you in certain places you don't have uh drinkable water at hand uh when you so you, you still have to organize this objective through a certain quality of life too it should not be something that conditions your your, your whole life in such a way uh, that you're miserable and and then still you don't have 100 percent of it that is the challenge we have that is our commitment to maintain this this safe healthy quality food brought to you in a in a very efficient way think about again plastic plastic has reduced also dramatically quite a lot of uh, uh, global warming in the sense of so light that transport so you have to see holistically through this but what you should do is, is saying it's complex uh, search it's an undoable thing you have yeah. to start it we didn't even start a journey we have been on that journey for quite a long while uh, yeah if you, long term you respect you respect these dimensions of society you answer them you take up your responsibility but we are accelerating and that is somewhere kudos to the the, the times we live in today the awareness We cannot wait more. So we have talked. We have to increase our efforts uh, uh, all together. We said yes, and we will do our part, and we will be explicit and report back on it. That is, I think, what the company has to say, uh, has to do. And yeah. Look, I don't know. That, that, that's right. Myself, a question. <laughs> um, yeah. We are a company, we, we are a company that is very visible. Uh, uh, many people do touch our. Brands, so they are close to uh, our company. So we are also vulnerable in the sense of we are also criticize because people can grasp what a company like ours does. They take a bottle of water and that's plastic. Um, uh, it's clear that a company that makes uh, blades for turbines and planes is further away from us. So that's why also we that's you may have heard back to this as uh, high trees catch more wind. I heard that somewhere. I said I told that somewhere. It is true that we are in that sense vulnerable and uh, hence um, also more reason to take up our responsibility, but not as a reaction on that criticism. What we do is by conviction, yeah. not by convenience. And and that's the strength that keeps it, having track in time. I, I, I couldn't plug almost, uh, I could not plug better uh, the next uh, question. Uh, Paul, because uh, it comes from Kamant Salari, and uh, and and you'll hear when she says her question, you'll hear how it plugs in so perfectly well what you just said. Kamant, uh, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so my question is that uh, you once quoted that high trees catches more wind. Uh, so what are the conflict and obstacles that the companies like Nestle um, are currently facing, and how are you managing them? You see, I knew it was coming. Thank you for your question. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I trees catch more wind. Uh, that's a, a proverb that we have in our in our country, uh, Peter. You know that, um, which is true. It's logical. Yeah. It's it's a logical thing, and uh, we are a sizable company. We we have a presence everywhere in the world, but it's a presence that is understood by consumers. Uh, because you touch my product uh, that Nestle produces, you look at it, you say that's plastic, or you turn. You eat a tablet of chocolate, and you have cocoa in there, and you have some issues in cocoa uh, uh, plantations. And so you say, "Hey, Nestle, that uh, guy, you're doing these things uh, because people are close to what we do, and which is good." And um, so we have a size. We are close to consumers. We are understandable in the sense that people do understand what we produce and how, and and uh, they know about the impact. And in that sense, I would say, look, uh, we do quite a lot of work on all these and we take our responsibility seriously uh, and then I have to say sometimes that I sometimes use uh, also the proverb of oh who told you the world is fair we sometimes feel it's not fair 
But that's how it is. I mean, you have to live it then. What you have to do is what you believe in is the right thing to do and, and do that. But what we have to do too is connect more with the broader society and the consumers on this. Hence, also through our products, communicate. Make your uh, activities transparent. Um, uh, be humble. You cannot do it all in one day. Look, let me give you an example. I'm creating through my comments always my own problems, but child labor in cocoa is a very sensitive one. And uh, so we have been monitoring now for almost 10 years in the uh, Central West Africa region, the Ivory Coast and Ghana, uh, the plantations that indirectly work, we work with. We have identified 80,000 children there. 18,000 of them, one eight thousand of them, were doing sometimes labor that could have been considered dangerous. We have already taken 10,000 out of them, out there. That is through uh, birth certificates, to make that the school is not too far, or transport to them, to, etc. We don't do that alone. We do that with local community uh, authorities or NGOs, local NGOs too, and all that. So. We, we, we work in collegially together in this. Take from the 18,000, 10,000 out. Shame on us, there's still 8,000. But you see, if we only get to the 8,000 and block everything, you should be. That, that's not an answer. Life is a little bit more complex, but it is where the action is in the trenches. It is doing there, being there, committed, staying. And, and, and working with your own convictions, your values, that you forge development. I spoke with a lady yeah. from Africa, um, and her father was a farmer, and she said, look, I was so proud when I was seven that I could work on the farm with my father. I said, hey, you are doing child labor. She said, well, look, you should understand what it means. This is not slavery. This is to be proud. That's how the community works. Don't use that as an argument to keep and not going after the 8,000 that are still left there. But we should also be sometimes humble understanding. And it is not by, by claiming in the Western world uh, that in development goes. It is by being there. And that's why we are still in Zimbabwe. That's why we are still in uh, Ivory Coast. That's why we are still in Venezuela. You yeah. four, it's, 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 it's a tough journey, but a rewarding one. I, yeah. I and think. It, you, you mentioned a very interesting point, and, and I want to bring up a question from Antonia Botget, uh, who is with us uh, also. Uh, she's saying, well, you know, you have, of course, clearly a, a moral compass that guides you a North Star. At the same time, and, and we see this again now, you're often also criticized for not being an ethical company. Um, you know, you take positions. In Switzerland, there was a referendum about, uh, it was called a Responsible Multinationals. Uh, and it said that Swiss multinationals like Nestle had to uh, defend themselves uh, in, in, in front of Swiss courts if they did things against Swiss laws abroad. Um, so, and, and you came out very strongly against that. You said, no, we shouldn't. That, that's not the right thing to do. So you, you see here, at the one, uh, on the one hand, you have clearly a very clear ethical compass. On the other hand, you're still often seen as unethical. How do you uh, deal with that uh, challenge, uh, uh, that sort of dissonance there? By staying your course. Um, first of all, uh, look, um, it's what my mother always told me. If you don't want to break a plate or a glass, don't go in the kitchen. It's only by doing things that you can. And, and so that's by being there, by being visible, by doing things that, that you may be exposed, but that's not the reason why you would then not do that. Uh, you see, the initiative in Switzerland is, is actually somewhere a sign of something in our society, the affluent society of the West, uh, where we go for our own clean conscience. But not seeing what it means, and uh, you see, this this initiative was for human rights and environment. Hey, who is against that? We are for that too, but with the initiative per se, that was not served. That was counterproductive because that was trying to have human rights and environment forged into the court in only in the courtrooms of Switzerland. You don't do that there. It's there for um, in, in the front line. And, and so 
that's why we stay very clear because how can you extend it to the uh, uh, extended supply chain of the company saying you're also liable for whoever is linked with you no, 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 wait, wait, wait. that would mean they are going to have to go out of seven countries but because i cannot assure they will secure although we do lots of uh, of auditing of our suppliers the big ones the small yeah. i work in seven thousand farms i cannot Take the, that, that goes against the fundamental principle of our legal system. Also, you are uh, you're a bad guy until you prove you're a good guy. That's the reversal of proof. So, in, in other words, this, this, the purpose was actually used as an argument for other means, for other targets, which was, hey, we have, we, 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 we have to level up as, as being a little bit uh, the good sum of judge in the world. We're going to dictate, hey, that's insulting. To these right. countries, they're trying to build their countries too. It's always some two steps forward, sometimes a back, uh, one step backward. But but, and that's that's just fair. And that's yeah. where I felt also we stand up there and mention that we have to connect with the Western world again uh, uh, more closely and saying, hey, that's what we believe in. That's how we operate. That's what what we uh, uh, how we operate. Uh, how yeah. we work. And these are our conditions. And you, and you clearly do have that. Eh? You say also you have to respect yourself. You have to, uh, when you take position, uh, you have to. Now, I, I want to, before we, we end, though, I want to bring in two uh, students that, that are online with us. The first one is, is Yessa. Uh, and Yessa, I think, has a very interesting question for you because you've been speaking so passionately about your job and your company. But, of course, there's a life outside it, too, isn't there, uh, Yessa? All right, thank you. Um, so... Uh, I'm, I was wondering, uh, thank you for, for your time. Um, in the food and beverage industry, uh, leaders and managers often, often change companies for a better position and in order to broaden their experience. Um, what were the key reasons or incentives that led you to stay at Nest? Well, first of all, I, I was never bored. Second, I could live my own principles in that company because we, they're, 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 they're overlapping, they're the same. Um, you know, we have, you know, we, we define our values as a company now very simply. It is, uh, they're based on respect. First, respect for yourself, as Stephen mentioned. Respect for yourself, that's where you get authentic. You're responsible. Uh, you, you, all these values come in when you respect yourself. We should learn to do that sometimes more. Be aware of ourselves and, and respect the other, which is where trust builds up. You, you deliver what you promise. So respect for yourself, respect for the other. Respect for diversity. The world is not one angle. It's different means of, uh, of seeing the same reality. It's not only gender, it's, it's also uh, a culture. We also taste. We, 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 we adapt our products to taste. We have 180 blends of Nescafe, which is somewhere respect for diversity. And then the third one, the, the fourth one is the most important one to some extent. Respect the future. And that's where this long-term vision comes in, where respect for the environment, respect for the next generation comes in. So these are our values. I could live up to that in a company like this. First, second, um, third, um, it is wrong to say you have to move on from company to company to have your next step, because then what you do is, you, the company is there for you then. You should be there for the company. And if you're there for the yeah. company, you have to look through this. This is a long, this is this the uh, career is not a short term to dash, um, and I I, I I had my moment that I said Jesus Christ should I change my company should I look forward to something else and I had opportunities and and that goes on you have to watch out not to be too too intense on my career kind of mindset and stay uh, uh, rather enjoy the journey and that can happen in the same company if you have a fine company and you can it's very important that you can be yourself. In a company, and if you cannot be yourself in a company because the values are not there, the principles, then you have to move on. But if you only move on to have another step up, another step up, another step up, you're going to be anxious permanently because you're there already thinking on the next step. So that is what I call permanent anxiety. That's not a very good quality of life, I must say. Uh, so I have been blessed of um, being part of a good company. There's so many of them. Um, yeah. And uh, look, uh, one thing, you're there for the company. And by doing so, you're there for yourself indirectly, uh, if you can live up to your values. If it is reversed, the company is there to, uh, for you, well, then you're going to be fleeing forward. 
permanently. Yeah. No other group. You you mentioned here the, the word permanent anxiety. I think a lot of us though, uh, and and although we value that that long term insight, um, you know, I think a lot of us after this year do feel a permanent anxiety, whatever job we're in and whatever company we're working for. I want to ask uh, uh, the last person to come forward, Sergey, uh, because he does I think have another question about you know the year that we just had and the pandemic, Sergey. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, actually, I would like to ask you for advice for us for students. How to maintain leadership in a high level in the corporate culture? How to maintain leadership? You mean as a person? Mm, yeah. Look, leadership has many, has many dimensions. So there's no one stereotype of leadership. It depends on the situation, depends on the person, depends on the community you lead. But I think there's a few common things. First of all, you have to have a clear view of what the purpose is. And that has gained so much more uh, uh, value now in what I would call by excellence an ambiguous rule. There is not one, re one reality. There is not one answer to things. So um, yeah, yeah, I have to maintain this, this, this dimension of contextual thinking. Uh, uh, purpose helps you. It's, it's your gyroscope somewhere. Um, and, and that should be uh, surviving the test of time. Values have a key view of uh, you know, values too. But also don't think you have all the answers. You don't need all the answers. Uh, you have just to have the trust we're going to give and find the answers. What you have to know is that's the hill to take. Yes, that's the hill to take. Let's take this hill. And then trust the people around you uh, and your own, I would say, uh, business or experience or acumen or professional capacity. I call that actually detached involvement. Let me explain that very fast. Um, detached involvement. You're involved in your life. You're the main actor of your own personal life. You're an actor. You're on the scene, acting your life with other people. So you're involved. At the same time, you have to be able to detach, which means you have to be able to sit in the public and observe yourself. That gives you a very, very interesting perspective on yourself. If you only have involvement, you do short-term things. You react short-term. You overreact. You, 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 you don't have the perspective. You have to have detached involvement. You have to be able to also observe yourself. And that has helped me through my whole career uh, also to see. And that creates then this, this possibility of leading because you transmit, hey, you know what, well, he, that guy knows where he is heading at. He can formulate it well and transmit to us. He can. So a good leader is somebody who can inspire somebody or a, a community. Inspire means purpose. Uh, without having all the answers, but he inspires, he takes the energy out of them and he makes them motivated to do uh, and go in the same direction. And, and so, but it is linked with the Dutch involvement. Yeah. And um, don't be bossy. Leadership is not a position. Leadership is dynamics, it's action, it's motivation, it's energy. So uh, it's easy to say, but you're gonna find your way, I'm sure. <laughs> That's great, and of course we want to end this question and of, with with the, with with the, with the ultimate question, uh, which actually yes, he also brought up uh, in in preparation. He said, you know what, what uh, what do you look forward to in the future? And 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 Sam McQuaid is asking a similar question. He says, I've been living in Vevey neighborhood for a long time, and I'm very curious. He says, um, what what excites you uh, about the future? And and perhaps we can also take some some positive energy from what excites you and what you see ahead in the future? But so many things. Look, we have this purpose. We want to be by excellence in nutrition health and company. Uh, the, so a company that really understands how nutrients and nutrition helps uh, uh, with, with health. It's a long, that's the fundamental journey of the company. Now I have so many other things. First of all, hey, uh, being part of uh, overcoming this, this pandemic, uh, it's, we, we, we're going to have a process of tomorrow, we're going to be better than yesterday on this. So we have a short term. We didn't need this, but we have it. So uh, taking care of that together uh, as, as uh, in the company, but also as part of society. Uh, then uh, the whole dynamics of, of the geopolitics is quite interesting. It's very ambiguous now. Eh? You see, we didn't have this black, white, east, west, uh, uh, which was relatively firm. That was how it was. No, it's much more complex. Uh, it's much more deeper. It's not only the Western world dictating anymore with our Confucian minds. It's now we're going to have to study Confucius. Peter, we talked about that. 
So, um, but it's very interesting to see uh, um, we have this specific program of net zero that we're going to start and uh, not start, continue, but more firmly, more explicitly, and more share with the broader community. So, um, uh, then the challenges of business uh, for business, which is, hey, this year, how are we going to land it? Next year, we're going to have to go and and, 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 and uh, split from certain parts of the company. We do portfolio management permanently. This is, uh, and, and people, what's so nice about it is, that's when I went to, to see markets and our operations, is to feel the energy of the people, the enthusiasm, and, that, and the alignment of that energy into the same direction you want this whole company and society to go. So um, you have also to say this pandemic has given so many opportunities. Think about, uh, think about how we connect now that is used as integral part of our lives. Um, think about e-commerce and all what we can do there. We have accelerated e-commerce big time. Uh, so uh, science, um, the understanding of how the microbiome works and how it is actually your second brain. And uh, it's offering products that are better for aging, uh, the aging population or people with specific needs. Um, how we can answer the plastic thing, or, or how can you not be enthusiastic? I mean, um, so I mean, lots of challenges, but so many of and uh, so many new means. Uh, I think also on science, real science. Uh, society is on the brink of a major jump. Think about this plasma computer. So uh, you, you know, it's, it's fantastic. And how we can uh, uh, cope and use this and frame this uh, to the benefit of the broader society. And that's as a company being part of this. I can't be motivated so much that my wife said, uh, why are you continuing? Uh, it's so, a, it's so incredible. You, you, you asked the question, how can you not be excited when looking to the future? I think uh, we now feel the same way. I, I got very energized by, by your talk. Uh, and I'm so glad that you spent uh, this time with us. I think uh, it really helps us to look to the future, to 2021, with so much more optimism and indeed excitement. For now though, Paul, I wanna thank you for being with us because it's been an amazing hour. We learned so much from you and we know that we have to be very, very grateful and we indeed we are. Thank you, Paul, for being with us. And then I think for a final word of thanks, let, let's turn to Luke. Uh, downstairs uh, thank in, here in Geneva. I, I thank you all. I, uh, I thank you all. This is a year end too, so I wish you all the best uh, for, for the year end in, in difficult times. But you know, extra, extraordinary difficult times uh, invite extraordinary people to stand up, and you're all part of that. You're all young, full of enthusiasm for the future, and, uh, and I can tell you um, it's going to be a, a very nice future uh, in spite of all. And uh, so, wish you all the best. Thank you for having me with you all and uh, yeah, keep it going. Be positive, be touched. Thank you. Going. Remember. For your energy and for your uh, optimism. I think we cannot uh, think of a better way to, to end this uh, season or uh, this, this year of learning from leaders. We will be back soon in, in January with some exciting uh, new speakers. Thank you very much for joining. Stay safe, everybody, and enjoy the holiday.